Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Today.com video, we're going to be tackling two pieces of news of the technology variety, as usual, which have popped up over the past 24 or so hours. The first piece of news concerns AMD's Ryzen Pro CPUs, which the company have formally announced today. We finally have information on what these CPUs will bring to the table, specifications, and other factors which differentiate them from the regular Ryzen CPUs on the desktop. And then we're going to move over to Vega, specifically the Frontier Edition, because yet more gaming performance data has been leaked onto the internet. So I say leaked because, well, at the moment all the reviews are from individuals who have managed to get hold of the GPUs slightly early when they've been purchasing from vendors. As some of you may be aware, unfortunately AMD have seen fit to not provide Vega to, well, professional review sites. So any idea of how these GPUs actually perform from real-world tasks, which basically shy away from AMD's own laboratories, we basically have to just take these early results from people who have bought the cards, which, to me, I don't really like, but there you have it. With all of that said, let's jump in. I actually received a couple of messages regarding this very topic. The first individual who did email it to me was Joe, but I also received a message from Brad, just a few minutes later, and then several other folks messaged me just a few minutes after that. So thank you to everyone who did uh, regarding the Ryzen Pro. So, what is Ryzen Pro? Well, it's basically Ryzen, but aimed at the professional market or business-orientated sector. There are certainly a lot of familiar features and specifications that Pro does share with the desktop. Uh, normal desktop derivatives, so we'll go into those real quick. Basically, Ryzen um, Pro has multiple SKUs. It has one, two, three, four, five, six SKUs to be total, uh, sorry, to be accurate. And obviously, these different differentiate themselves with the number of clock, uh, sorry, cores available, the clock speed, the amount of cache, and so on. But Taking the Ryzen 7 Pro 1700X, for example, it has a base clock of 3.5, boost of 3.7, level 3 cache of 16 megabytes of 95 watts TDP. On the other hand, the uh, Ryzen 5 Pro 1600, 6, uh, 6 cores, 12 threads, 3.2 base, 3.6 boost, 16 megabytes of level 3 cache, but 3 megabytes of level 2, and 65 watts TDP. In other words, most of the specifications are going to sound very familiar to anyone who has a passing familiarity with these particular processors. Also, Ryzen Pro does fully support ECC, like other Ryzens, but certain limitations are there with data transfer rates and so on, and it would appear that Pro does not have any differences here. AMD have only, at least from what we've read from their brochures, they have only tested with DDR4 2400 memory with the Pro CPUs. So obviously, once CPU makers or whomever get hold of these CPUs, it's really down for them to use either the same speed or basically take their own risks. What other features? Well, I'm not going to read out all of them because basically a lot of the features sound very familiar. It has Sense MI, Precision Boost, Extended Frequency Range, and so on and so on. Pretty much everything that the regular desktop CPUs can do. So, okay, you're going to say to yourself, well, what the hell is the actual difference then? Why would I plonk down more money? Well, really, it comes down to business uses. For one, it has an extended warranty. Basically, if you were to purchase a regular Ryzen, you get a 12-month warranty. On the other hand, the pros get 36-month warranty. Now, admittedly, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, hopefully it doesn't break in, you know, 13 months' time, and it probably won't, let's just be honest, but you never know. The other benefit for the pros is better binning, better quality silicon. Now, obviously, I do not have a pro sitting next to me right now. I just don't have that. So the reason I bring that up is because already we're hearing some folks say, well, does that mean overclocking is going to be better? So, for example, the typical overclock for a lot of Ryzen's, obviously, it does depend upon Silicon Lottery, what motherboard you're using, the cooler you're using, whether you've decided to make your, you know, blood sacrifice for this for this week. But generally, you're looking at around 3.9 to 4.1 gigahertz. So let's say 4 gigahertz as the average, which isn't awful, but a lot of it really comes down to the process that Ryzen is built upon. 
is built on the 14nm LPP, low power process, which doesn't really lend itself super well to high-end overclocking. There are a couple of other bits and pieces as well, such as the TDP that the process is running on, and possibly some other bits that we're not too familiar with, or well, not too sure about, because ultimately AMD are kind of keeping shtum to it. It's probably just a design, and I do feel that the next gen possibly might introduce um, higher clock speeds into the mix. So maybe Pro will overclock better, Perhaps it might go to like 4.1 to 4.3 gigahertz, so maybe a couple of hundred megahertz as a boost. But unfortunately, we don't know that. It's just a guesstimate on my part. What else? Well, the other thing is the security side of things. So AMD are being quite boisterous about this. And AMD being interested in security with their pro CPUs, in other words, processors which are meant for the high-end market isn't new. They've always had AMD Secure Processor. You can Google that. But they are bringing in two new technologies which really are the crux of the matter. They really come down to Transparent Secure Memory Encryption, known as TSME, if you prefer. These boil down to two important technologies. One is Secure Memory Encryption, SME, and SEV, which stands for Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Now, this is using a 128-bit engine to do this. So, how does this work? Well, it's kind of a long topic, and I have been through this in a separate video several months ago. But the too long didn't read is that, generally speaking, if a device, say a hard drive is plugged into your PC, data can be encrypted. Not really shocking. You could use whatever encryption tool you want. And obviously, that data then needs to be unencrypted for it to, to be processed, right? So what generally happens is when it's being moved out of a storage device, let's say for the sake of argument, SSD, a DVD, whatever, whatever the storage device is, it then needs to be unencrypted for it to be resident in temporarily in RAM. What this basically means, however, is that in theory, you can then snoop into that data. This particularly happens when you're dealing with virtual machines or just errant programs that decide, hmm, I want to do some snooping, me do. So SME encrypts data when it's written to DRAM and then encrypts it again as it's read. Um, and then basically the hardware itself uh, receives the key, it gets the, you know, along with the virtual address, and basically it continues to be encrypted, unencrypted, encrypted, unencrypted as it's being processed. The other benefit of this is the logical extension, which is SEV, which is Secure Virtualization. Now, what this basically does is that it enables owners to encrypt a virtual machines. From what I understand, there are performance penalties involved on this. I don't believe they're high. Um, I believe it's quite minuscule, but obviously it's just something for you to be aware of. So what this essentially does is that if you have an, a virtual machine which is encrypted, let's say someone else has a virtual machine, so let's say you have virtual machine 1 and 2, and you're running on your own main virtual machine, if you have Virtual Machine 1 that's processing a piece of data, Virtual Machine 2 that's processing a piece of data, never the twain shall meet. In other words, Virtual Machine 1 cannot snoop, it can be infected with viruses or whatever, and generally it cannot be um, affecting the second one. I believe there are some things it doesn't pr protect against. I'm not 100% on that, I need to do a bit more reading. But generally it is considerably more secure than not doing this. Also, and pretty obviously, it does require support of BIOSes, operating systems, and whatever else. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's plug and play. The other thing Ryzen Pro brings to the table is Dash Management Protocol. This allows Pro systems to be remotely managed using tools, which are based upon an industry standard. The only slight problem with these CPUs is very simple. It does not have an integrated graphics chip. Now, for gamers, you don't care. You're probably saying, well, who cares about that? That does not affect me at all. And you're right. The problem is, when it comes to the Dells of the world and, you know, basic office PCs, they don't really require 10,000 frames a second in Doom. Instead, what they care about is making a small form factor device, which is 
you know, as cheap as possible for as good as performance as possible for the task that's running. Now, obviously, if this machine is going to be doing, let's say, Photoshop work or video editing on top of everything else, then yes, a dedicated graphics card is certainly going to be important. But if it's not doing that, if it's going to be just running several virtual machines for, let's say, spreadsheet usage and, I don't know, like databases and whatever else, then that's not really required. And a basic GPU, you know, that basically does something that along the lines of Intel's Iris uh, range is, is more than enough. So that's definitely something that could be a black mark against Ryzen. But other than that, it looks like the performance and pricing is going to be quite nice. Unfortunately, at least at the time I'm recording this video, there is no pricing information upon these processors. Okay, back to Vega. So I did tackle some of this stuff yesterday. But a few more benchmarks have popped up from a couple of users. One being Claudius, also known as Define, has decided to place more information upon the Radeon Vega Frontier Edition that he has. For those who don't know, this individual is running an i7-4790K, overclocked to 4.4 GHz, and he has decided to place a few more benchmarks, one being Spec View Perf 12.1, and honestly, the performance is pretty impressive when you take everything into consideration. But um, it's not necessarily apples to apples testing because obviously he is running a 4790. And well, yeah. Um, also, on top of that, another user has managed to grab a Vega card. And unfortunately, he has uploaded a YouTube video of his performance. But quite frankly, most of the tests that he has run, I'll link to his video in the description, but honestly, most of the tests, you can barely see the frame rate numbers. They are so... It, I don't know what he was using for um, a camera. It was awful. Like, it was it was so bad that you, you couldn't really tell whether it was 100 frames a second or whether it was, like, 2 frames a second in terms of... Because it kept on, A, being stuttery, and B, like, the resolution just kept on going all over the shop. But as I said, I'll link to it. But um, he did test a variety of different games, including Metro Redux, Doom. And basically, he did manage to get Time Spy, which was 6,748 for the uh, graphics score. And he also tested our other friend and buddy, Firestrike Ultra, um, which is coming up with a validation warning. But he did score 5,068 with that. He also tested Metro. As far as I'm able to tell... Uh, advanced Physics was off, he's running at 4K with SSAA on, which is not typically what you do for frame rate testing, but he received an average frame rate of 20 frames per second. Unsurprising, given once again he was running it with SAA on. And also, there's another benchmark of Ryzen, um, sorry, of a Cinebench R15. He's getting 97, basically 98 frames per second on that particular benchmark. So, you know, Vega, basically, it looks to me... Uh, I'm still getting a couple of messages saying it's with old drivers. They're not. Basically, what's happening um, is that, basically, the drivers are being read incorrectly by GPU-Z or what have you. So, as far as I understand, it's the, the correct drivers that he is using. Um, there was also another user who tested... Sorry, the user also tested mining, and it got between 29 to 33 MHS, but that was overclocked. Admittedly, it was only a slight overclock. It was 1650 megahertz on the core, for example. So that's only 50 megahertz overclock. So it's probably still within the realms of what it would do, you know, with a base, un with a base clock. Unfortunately, and you're probably going to, you know, be echoing these sentiments in the comments, or at least I'm assuming you are, these results are just not indicative of, you know, the results that would be ideal. You know, frankly, I would... I, I, I can't I can't I can't blame the users because some people are being really critical of them and saying, Hey, you know, what the hell, why aren't you using good cameras? Or what the hell, why aren't you doing this? Or why don't you know why are you uh, one user, the Claudius was running a five hundred watt five hundred and fifty actually, I think, watt PSU. And they were saying, Well, what the hell are you doing that for? And then you're buying this. But the fact of the matter is, it's like you can't blame the user. I admittedly, in my opinion, it's a bit silly to be running such an expensive GPU with such an expen with such a, a low power PSU. I'm not I'm not saying that that's incorrect, but I kind of don't blame him 
because that's really down to, you know, the user. If he decided to buy that card, but also have, I don't know, like an E4300 clocked at default clock speeds with 4 gigabytes of RAM or a DDR2 memory, that's all down to him. That's the performance of the card is not really being shown off in the best light, which is not, once again, the user's fault. In my opinion, this is somewhat down to AMD. And some folks are saying it's, you know, the cards are disappointing, they're not hitting the performance targets that AMD set. Well, unfortunately, once again, that these cards are aimed at the semi-professional market, but also the drivers are obviously not mature enough yet. It looks to me anyway like the drivers need a bit more maturity. And at least in my opinion, that's probably why AMD are not giving these cards out to reviewers, because obviously one of the things they're going to do is immediately start running games. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter. Uh, but what I mean by that is, like, it's the 29th now, so I, I don't know what date. Let's, let's pull a number out of my ass. Let's say by the 3rd. So, essentially Monday. So, it's the 29th now, which is the Thursday. So, by the 3rd Monday, there's going to be at least several more people who own these cards. You know, there's probably a few more. There's probably, you know, they are going to appear. People are going to, you know, be buying them from their works. They're going to be grabbing them. You know, the weekend's going to happen, so more folks are going to have more time testing. Blah, 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 blah. And there's going to be a lot more results. So it's better to actually put these in the hands of the reviewers. I'm not saying a load of reviewers, even just a few reviewers, seed them out to specific people, say, hey, for the gaming performance, we're still working on the drivers, and just kind of get that out there. That's my opinion, anyway. But I do believe the cards are going to be pretty good. I, If I had to take a guess, and I am only guessing here, I don't own the cards myself. If someone wants to send me a card, feel free, but I don't own one, and I'm not going to plonk down a $1,000 on a found, uh, I'm sorry, on a Frontier Edition. So, you know, if you want to send me one or lend me one, feel free. Other than that, I'm not doing the testing. Um, but basically, from what I understand, it's probably going to be between the 1080 and the 1080 Ti in terms of level of performance. Um, hopefully a little bit more. With maybe driver maturity, it might just pip past 1080s high. So what does that mean? Well, if you're imminent R-ing and you've got a really cheap deal, you can get a really good deal on, let's say, a 1080. Maybe your friend's upgrading to a 1080 tie and you can get a really good deal from him or her. Then I would suggest jumping on it. On the other hand, if you're wanting an AMD graphics card, for example, so you've got a free sync monitor, you may want to stick with AMD because, let's face it, to take advantage of a free sync monitor fully, you need an AMD card. In which case, by all means, grab AMD. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.